Again, it's good to be back on this Wednesday night Bible study. And we are studying from the book of John, the fourth book of the biographical section of the New Testament. It is, as we've pointed out every week when we started this, a book that is designed to prove that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. John is different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are synoptic in the sense that they basically cover from his beginning to throughout his life and so on. But this one is different. He selects different people as testimony and witnesses or for their testimony uh, to give witness that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, last week, we were in chapter 6, and we got down to the point where he was talking about the bread of life. And he says, I am the bread of life. Well, we see when you come down to about verse 51, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The next point is, is that the Jews strove among themselves about that comment. They could not think of anything but literally and actually eating his human flesh. And that caused a problem. Then we see this focus in on his disciples. And again, remember, John is offering this as evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God. Now, again, let me urge you to read these. We don't have time to cover every word, but we want to emphasize the part that John does emphasize. In effect, what happens or what the outcome of this is, is that this teaching ends up, shall we say, sifting his disciples challenge them i want to talk a little bit about that before we get into it there are numbers of things in the bible that when we learn them they challenge us as to our confidence faith and belief in god now these are disciples that means they're followers and they're following to learn of him the idea of discipline but now he says something that just astounds them and many of them found this sermon, his own disciples, as did those who were not, some of them, found his teaching on the bread of life to contain, as they said, hard sayings. Let me comment a little further about that. I suggest to you that as you're studying throughout the scriptures, when it comes to the demands God makes of us to be what we need to be to go to heaven, then there's always the danger on our part that we will let our own viewpoints, think so's and affairs as they work in this world, cause us to think that, well, that's rather hard. That's rather difficult. Uh, why would he ask that? Why would he say that? Well, when he said, I'm the bread of life and you must eat this bread, that was a hard saying to them. And you see, they complained, they murmured, they grumbled. And the Lord said to them that he would return to the Father and that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives life. And then he says something that's quite interesting. He says, the words I've spoken to you our spirit, and they are life. That's important to think about. We know the Holy Spirit is the one who revealed the mind of God to us, such inspiration means in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures give them inspiration of God, literally breathed out from God. Thus, if you don't know God's will, he must reveal it to us. Now, when it comes to seeing evidence that whereby we can conclude that God exists, 
then we can do that from the orderliness and such like from the universe and things around about us, even our own being. But to understand the will of God for us, how we're to live in this life, how we prove to God that we love him, that we have faith in him, that we have confidence in him, it takes revelation. And that means the Bible. And more specifically concerning Christ, it means the New Testament. But now notice that at this time, this was so hard with some of these people. They had their minds set in a certain way, and it wasn't going to be changed. That they went back and walked no more with him. Now notice how the Lord used this. He turned then to the 12 apostles themselves. And he asked them, will you also go away? And, of course, Simon Peter, as he was apt to do, did this time. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. The American Standard reads, Simon Peter answering him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And uh, we believe and know that thou art the Holy One of God. Now, I think it's interesting to note that one can believe and know at the same time. This flies in the face of this false doctrine that's around that says the only thing you can know is what you can perceive with your five senses, and which is just not so. You can arrive at definite knowledge by contemplation. I've used this example more times than I could remember to prove that. In becoming a Christian, Saul of Tarsus repented of his sins. I know that as surely as I know my own name. But you cannot find an explicit statement in the New Testament, and an explicit statement is said in just so many words, that says that Saul of Tarsus in the process of becoming a Christian repented of his sins. Well, then how can I know that he repented of the sins? Because I know what the New Testament teaches one must do in order to become a Christian. And one of those things is repent of sins. Now, did Saul of Tarsus become a Christian? Indeed, he did. Thus, by implication, I know that he repented. And thus you take in all the evidence, the facts, and you reason from them, and you can draw a definite conclusion when you have the adequate evidence and you're using credible witnesses. And I'll say this again. Um, I don't have any time to have said this, but our whole jurisprudence system operates with that idea in mind. Now you think of a jury. Well, they weren't there to see with their own eyes or hear. With any of their or see with any of their senses, their witness say a murder case. Why well, are they going to bring in a guilty verdict? There has to be adequate evidence, credible witnesses that notice beyond a reasonable doubt that they can bring in that verdict. Well, I believe in God because there's enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. I can I can believe that He exists. I know He exists. My faith. Confidence, trust, belief in God, in Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Bible, plan of salvation, all the Bible says, church, organization, work, worship, life of a Christian, so on. I know those things, thus my faith is right. If you don't know those things, your faith can't be right. And thus the Lord was doing some teaching here. And yet the people wouldn't hang around and listen, many of them. It was a hard saying. That reminds us of 2 Kings chapter 5 and the account of Naaman, the leper. He anticipated the prophet when he finally got there in Israel to do something like all the pagan people did that he was used to. But all he did was send Gehazi out. Gehazi's his servant. Tell Naaman what to do, and that was go dip seven times in the river Jordan. Well, he just got beside himself. That's just not the way it's done. That's not the way it's done. 
but he settled himself down when he listened to some he knew who had better level headedness than he did. And so he resolved to go dip seven times the River Jordan. And lo and behold, he was made clean because of his faith. Might mention his faith didn't do anything for him until he obeyed. He did what God said do the way God said do it for the reason. So if our faith in God and Christ and so on is to be correct, accurate, then we must have knowledge proper knowledge. Thus, then, we can have faith. And even then, it's just not mentally ascending to the fact in the case. It must be a living, active, obedient faith, as was Naaman. Well, these folks had been disciples, so they hit a stone, as far as they were concerned. And they were not willing to stay around and learn more. There's been a, many people who have something that causes them just to reminds me of sitting in the car and these automatic windows, you just don't want to have the air blowing on you. You just hit the window, and it raises up, stops it right there. Well, people have those things happening in their mind. They hear something, won't even listen to that anymore. And people are like that, and the devil knows it, and he uses it very well, and thus they go away because that's a hard saying. So in this particular section in chapter 6, we have further direct testimony of the Lord himself. We have further testimony of John the Apostle. Remember, he's the one doing the writing. And we have the wonderful and beautiful testimony of the Apostle Peter, which testimony would have a strong appeal to the Jews. So there's great lessons in this. Now, are there other lessons? Well, yes, but I'm trying to show why we have John primarily that he is proving that Christ is the Son of God. Well, we move from that. And again, if you've got any more questions regarding those things, please let me know. I, well, let me make one comment about um, where he said uh, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We remember Ephesians uh, 6, 17 and discussing the whole armor of God that we must put on that Paul said the sword of the spirit is the word of God. We also remember Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 where we learned that the spirit is sharp and cuts asunder soul, spirit, joints, marrow, the dis discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The message that J.D. brought a while ago concerning changing, only the Word of God can do that. The instrument the Spirit uses to convict us of sin, convert us to Christ, and to cause us to be stronger as a Christian to grow, to be edified, is through the Word of God. Now, it's obvious then that when Jesus says that they are spirit and they are life, that is the words he spoke, that he's talking about how God reaches us to save us from our sins. It's also important to understand that Jesus would say to the disciples or apostles in particular, now you're clean through the word which I've spoken unto you. Well, the word is spirit and life. Uh, they were clean through the word that he spoke to them. It didn't mean they just sat and listened to the words. It meant they complied with the teachings of those words. So when a person's saved, he can't be saved apart from the words that are spirit and life. And he can't be saved on his own without those words. So it becomes obvious it takes both. The person who's humble to receive the message of those words, understand the instructions God has given the person, and then humbly believe and obey from the heart, as Paul wrote in Romans 6, verse 17. So the whole heart's involved in obedience, but the spirit and life 
comes through our reception humbly in obedience to the truth that is revealed in those words that are spirit and life. So I want to emphasize that, that point. Now, going into chapter 7, uh, we have further testimony offered by John. The testimony of the Christ himself as he was involved at the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, Jesus was involved in his work in Galilee. And he was purposely avoiding Judea. Why? Because the Jews in Judea were seeking to kill him. We've already learned that from our study. It was the time then for the Jewish feast day or feast of the tabernacles. And the Lord's own brothers tried to persuade him to go to the feast and to continue to perform his miracles and thus become better known. And they argued it this way, no man doeth anything in secret and himself seeketh to be known openly. I think that's quite interesting in view of the fact that his brethren did not believe he was son of God until after his resurrection. It does make you wonder what was going on in their minds. But they wanted to see more signs also. John adds, for even his brethren did not believe on him. Well, the Lord responds, and this is interesting. He says, my time's not yet come. Again, this reminds us that everything is laid out decently in an order by God. And so it was with Christ in the flesh on earth doing the work of God to save us. He says, the world cannot hate you, but it hateth me because I testify of it, that its works are evil. He then said, I go not up to the feast. Now watch, at this present time. We learn from the scriptures that later he did go up to the feast, but notice he didn't go up publicly. He went up secretly. And at this feast, there was much interest in him being exhibited. They were looking for him. He had made such an impact on them when he was there before. And the Jews sought him and they said, well, you know, where is he? There was, we learned, murmuring among the multitudes concerning. And we see a little bit of what they were saying. They, some said he was a good man. Others says, He's a deceiver. Well, you know, people are like that today. Some people will hear a great gospel sermon or a great lesson from a faithful Christian, and they'll just think it's wonderful. But other people say, ah, oh, biggest bunch of stuff you ever heard. Well, that tells us how we're so much in control of our own minds as to how we see things. And that's very important. And we might ask ourselves the question, how do I view Christ? How do I think of him? Am I open to receiving adequate evidence, credible witnesses that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Well, halfway through the feast, Jesus showed up, and he enters the court in, there in the temple, and he began to teach. And the teaching he did amazed the Jews. Our Lord taught that my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. He says, if any man wills to do God's will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it's of God or whether I speak from myself. Now that says a mouthful and then some. We must understand that if we do not want the truth, we won't get it. We'll never get it. Well, what does that mean? It means we must have an honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15, that we're capable 
of having something proven to be the case to us. Now, if somebody doesn't want to believe in God, that person's not going to believe in God. If a person does not want to believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, they won't. If they don't want to believe the Bible is the Word of God, they want, if they do not want to believe in hell as the final abode, eternal abode of the wicked, or they don't want to believe in heaven as the final abode of the blessed, they won't. People ask me, well, why do you believe in God? Well, I think one of the first reasons I believe in God is I want to believe in God. Well, why do I want to believe in God? Well, I can sum it up this way very quickly, and we can move on. He's the best explanation for how things got here and why life is what it is, where I came from, what I'm here for, and where I'm going. If I turn to the atheist idea that matter is eternal and everything's just an accident, I've got insurmountable problems that arise. And if you want to see how at the time, one of the most, I'll say infamous, they would say famous atheists in the world back in 1976, dealt with Brother Warren and his debate with him. And I'm talking of Anthony Flew, how he could not meet Brother Warren's arguments, period. And one of the reasons that I want to believe is that I'm a reasonable person. I have the power of rational powers. I have an intellect. I can understand. And I cannot see how design can be without a designer. I cannot explain how a thing ought to be this way by evolution by accident from eternal matter that I can't explain how it came to be because it's not alive and on and on we can go. Christ said to these people at that time, I work to bring honor to him who sent me. The one whom God has sent is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, they were big on saying, well, we follow Moses. Well, he takes that on and throws it right back in their face. He says, you claim to hold on to Moses, meaning the law and so forth. But then he said, you don't keep the law. He said, you are seeking to kill me. He said, I did one miracle that was on the Sabbath day. And everybody was astonished. And you think I violated the Sabbath law. And then he says, but think of yourself. You circumcise a child on the Sabbath day because a child is to be eight days old when it's circumcised, the law said, Moses said. And if that eighth day comes on the Sabbath day, you do that. But you don't think that you're violating the Sabbath. He says, I make a man whole on the Sabbath. And you think of it. What effort was that for the Lord to do that? None as far as human effort is concerned. And he says, you're upset about it. How do you justify yourself? circumcising to keep the law on the Sabbath day when that involves action and work on your part. But here I make a man whole on the Sabbath day and all you can see is that something was done and it shouldn't have been done on the Sabbath day. Well, that of course exposed them for binding their traditions and setting aside with their traditions the will of God. He said, you Jews do not know God but I know him and I'm from him and he sent me. Now he says, I'll be with you only for a brief period, short time. And then I go to the one who sent me. You're going to look for me. But you won't be able to find me. And then this is a horrible statement when you think about what it means. 
where I am, you cannot come. Which is saying to them, you'll never be with me in heaven. He asked them one time, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And if you don't go to heaven, the only other place is hell. Now, look further. The Lord had been rejected in Judea. We saw that in John chapter 5, verse 18. He had been rejected up in Galilee, uh, verse 66 of John 6. He had been rejected in the land of the Gadarenes. We learn from Matthew chapter 8 and verse 34. He had been rejected in Samaria, Luke 9, verse 53. Yet on the last day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he wasn't whispering. He cried with a loud voice. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Whoever believes in me, he says, then out of him will flow streams of living water. And by this we learn he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And of course, this happened on the day of Pentecost. This didn't mean the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, had never been working on earth. That's not true. But never did he do what he did as he did it when the church started in Acts chapter 2 to give full proof that this church and the message, the gospel, is from God, from heaven, and not from men, as he did on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. Well, leaving those things, we see the testimony of the officers during the feast uh, you'll remember the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him well they, they come to where he's teaching and when they get there they listen to him and to say the least they were much impressed by what he had to say well, remember why they were sent. So in time, these officers went back to the chief priest and the Pharisees, but they went back without the Christ. So these chief priests and Pharisees asked these officers, why didn't you bring him? Now, this just bowls me over when I read it. The officer said, never Man so spake. No one ever spoke the way this man does. I would have loved to have heard that. That is the words of Christ. We know elsewhere it says he spoke as one having authority and not as the scribes. There was something about him while he was just a man in appearance. A Jewish man who wasn't necessarily handsome but it was what he was as God in the flesh that came out through him remember he said to his disciples when you've seen me you've seen the father when we look to Christ we see how God would live if he were a man for he became a man and that's what was impacting them never man spake like this The Pharisees said, are you also gone astray? Has he led you astray too? Has anybody else of our group believed on him? And then they start to do what a lot of folks still do today. Well, this rabble, this multitude, they don't know the law. They're cursed. You can't depend on them. Well, that tends to say only the elite, and you can imagine who judges who's elite intellectually, who's not, especially at that time, but still today, can understand. But I think it's interesting the Bible records that the common people heard him gladly. The ordinary person, 
they hurt him badly. But it's interesting that at this point, Nicodemus, the one who came to Jesus by night, we've already studied that in John 3, spoke up and said to those round about him, he was one of them, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Well, of course, the law of Moses didn't. It always allowed the other side to speak up and be heard. And, of course, that's a good rule of jurisprudence. Even today, if you have a court, nobody there says a New Testament Christian. The charge has a right to his day in court, as we say, and to face his accusers. And in our country, one is not guilty until proven guilty. He's innocent until proven guilty. So it's important to understand that here's a principle that is tremendously important for ourselves to understand who Jesus Christ is. Are we capable of objectively looking at the evidence and honestly embracing it, no matter what sacrifices we must make if we accept where the evidence leads us? Well, let's look at what we learned from chapter 7. We see various responses to the Lord, and what do we find? Well, we find his own brethren, especially brethren, did not believe on him. Some murmured among themselves, complained, and grouped, and whatever else. And we find that some others were saying, well, he's a good man. Others were saying he's a deceiver, which means he's a liar. He's a servant of Satan. Some asked questions about him, which they couldn't answer. Some were amazed or they marveled at what he did. On the other hand, some wanted to kill him. Some Jews said he violated the Sabbath law. Some believed on him. The Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, wanted to take him and kill him. Those they sent to arrest him came back without him and said, we never heard anything like this coming from a human being. And then the chapter closes with Nicodemus. At least to some extent, we'll say it that way, appealed for justice for him. I'd like to know a whole lot more about what happened to Nicodemus, but we don't. Scriptures are silent as to what was the final outcome with Nicodemus concerning did he become a Christian or did he not? Now, the Lord himself claimed that he came from God. And notice he doesn't mince words. He says, I came from him. He said, not only that, but I'm going back to him. And, of course, he prophesies of his death and resurrection. And he makes it clear that he is the means of man's salvation. And that by means of him, the Spirit would be given. And that's important to understand. Because Christ is the only mediator between God and man. He has all authority in heaven and earth. He will talk to the apostles in John 14, 15, and 16 about when he goes away that the Holy Spirit would take his place. But the Holy Spirit would be invisible. So he could not be taken as Christ was taken and because Christ was human and killed, the Holy Spirit would be with him as another parakletos, a comforter that nobody could uh, take. The Lord exposed the sins of the scribes and Pharisees in chapter 8. Now we've mentioned at other times about him exposing them. Sometimes I think in reading through the scriptures, we don't realize how the Lord, <laughs> like a better way to put it in our modern terms, got right up in their face with their sins. So when we come into chapter 8, we see he enters the temple. He sits down 
and he begins to teach. I think it's interesting to note that today all teachers usually stand up. But in those days, the students tended to stand up and the teacher sat down. Well, what happens? The scribes and Pharisees brought to him a certain woman. Now, what's interesting here, she's taken in the very act of adultery. Let me just say up front, if she was taken in the very act of committing adultery, there was somebody else they left out, and that was the man. The scribes and the Pharisees said, Teacher, this woman's been caught in adultery. Notice they emphasize in the very act, the way the American Standard reads. Then they say, now the law, now Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what, what do you say? Now, you know they're not seeking information just for the sake of information, to be enlightened. They want to entrap him. Remember, they've been trying to kill him anyway. They've, they've already sent. The council did people to arrest him. So they were seeking grounds on which to accuse him. Jesus stooped down, and with his finger, he wrote on the ground. Let me talk about this for a moment, as we did regarding the statement of Nicodemus back in John 3, that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. I know Jesus stooped down. I know with one of his fingers, he wrote on the ground. I don't know anything else about it. And nobody else does either. Because it is not revealed. There's all sorts of speculations, but nobody knows. The scribes and the Pharisees, though consented, they, they persisted actually in questioning him. Well, we see the Lord, as the scripture says, straightened up. And then he asked the question. You'd think they'd learn after a while, but they didn't. He asked the question, who's without sin among you? Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. That's basically what he said. But when he finished that, he again stoops down on the ground, or stoops down, and he writes on the ground again. Some people have speculated, they have no evidence, and said he wrote the name of the man that was there. <laughs> well, I admit that'd be humorous if he did, but nobody knows what he wrote. But he wrote before, and he stood up and said these things, and he then stooped back down and rolled on the ground again. And one by one, the scribes and Pharisees departed, leaving the woman alone. Jesus then turns to the woman and says, Woman, where are they? Your accusers. Did no one condemn you? And she answered him, no, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go your way and sin no more. Now, it's important to understand here that the Lord didn't say, I'll overlook that scene, that you didn't see. He just says, I forgive you. We better hope the Lord looks at every one of us the same way he did that woman. It's his prerogative to show mercy and grace. And that's what he did. And then he turns around and tells her, don't sin anymore. And you know, really, the New Testament does that for us. We learn what to do to have our alien sins forgiven, baptized in Christ for the remission of sins. But then John tells us, 1 John 2, my little children, I'm writing unto you that you sin not. Same thing as far as in principle. And so this is what happened here. I'm about out of time. Some of you all, and maybe all of you, 
have heard me relate this, but I was in a testifying in a court case regarding a divorce situation. And we were trying to show what the church did in withdrawing fellowship, why we did what we did. And the lawyer for the man who was a member of the church and served as a deacon and knew very well what was going on, tried to say that we had uh, violated his confidence in coming there before the church. And we had to go through all that on the witness stand to show why the thing was put before the church and so forth. But he referred me to this passage and he wanted me, he said, uh, what was the last thing that Jesus said to this woman? Well, he was wanting me to say, he used out sin, cast first on. <laughs> I said, the last thing, sir? He said, yes. I said, go thy way and sin no more. <laughs> That's the only time I would love to be able to, that was long before the days of videos or anything else, but I'd love to have seen, had that captured on video. And he stumbled around and said, well, didn't he say something else? I said, yes, he said plenty, but you asked me the last thing he said to her. I always found that interesting, that once you gain the Lord's forgiveness by his mercy and grace, that you still are obligated not to sin anymore, even as this woman. Neither do I condemn you. Go thy way and sin no more. When a person today hears the gospel, from the truth in it believes in Christ, repents of sins, and confess one faith in Christ, and is baptized in Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord forgives us. But then we're to live faithful, and that's saying, go thy way and sin no more. Well, our time's up. Let's close with a word of prayer. So would you bow with me? Our Father in heaven, for this time together, we're grateful. Someday it'll be the last time we'll be able to be together in an assembly like this of thy people. So help us to cherish this fellowship and study thy word and the worship of thy holy name. Bless us throughout life to love thee and obey thee and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, to teach the truth plainly and forthrightly, and defend faith. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to be penitent and forgiving toward others as they repent. And help us always to strive to walk the straight and narrow way of truth. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.